Hello, and welcome back to Microchips Coffee Break, where we break down and explore trending topics and ideas of interest, all in the time it takes you to drink one, maybe two cups of coffee. I'm your host, Ross Sayat, and I'm happy to have you back with us again today. Today's topic is something that touches all of us well, probably every day, dozens if not hundreds of times. Uh, and yet we, we go about without really thinking about it. It's formally known as the Global Navigation Satellite System, more commonly known as GPS, SatNav, other names, but uh, we, we typically call it GPS. And here today to, uh, to provide some color and some insight into what's going on uh, is Duke Buckner. Duke is a uh, marketing director from our frequency and timing business unit. Uh, Duke, welcome, ha glad to have you with us today. Hey, thanks, Ross. Uh, happy to be here today. Looking forward to our discussion. Well, before we get to that discussion, let us go quickly to our man in the booth, my alter ego, the man with the control on the chat line, Austin Caphammer. And Austin, maybe you can share with everybody uh, how they can get in touch with us. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction, Ross. I'm looking forward to our discussion today on the Global Positioning System. Uh, today we are broadcasting live on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. We've got some experts in the chat standing by to answer your questions. As always, if our audience would like to like and share this presentation, it is highly appreciated. And if we don't have a chance to get to your question, please email us at livestream at microchip.com. Once again, it's livestream at microchip.com. Back to you, Ross. Great, thanks, Austin. So, so Duke, when we, when we look at GPS, I mean, it's something that we all touch or touches us every day. Everybody uses it. It's been around for quite some time, but, but I, there are some vulnerabilities that are becoming apparent in the system. And I thought maybe you could spend some time uh, to sort of walk us through what those issues are. Sure. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, most of us interact with GPS every day through our cell phone using some uh, map program or, you know, receiving some targeted ads based on where we're at. Uh, you know, so it's just a little background on GPS, uh, you know, it came about in the 1970s. Um, uh, it stands for the Global Positioning uh, Satellite System, and um, it operates uh, nominally 27 satellites in inclined planes about 12,500 miles above the Earth. Uh, one of the issues is it broadcasts very weak signals uh, when they're received on Earth. Um, but one of the real benefits is it provides global coverage, uh, except near the poles, so that we can receive it uh, anywhere on the basically on the face of the planet. You know, the challenge with with it is, uh, you know, it's proliferated so much in, in our phones and, and other devices that uh, the technology's you know become quite commoditized, and um, you know, and so receivers are are in everything. Um, you know, so we'll, today we'll focus on. Um, uh, in critical infrastructure, uh, the uh, the uses of it, and and what we'll talk about is the uh, the use of time instead of uh, necessarily position. But GPS gives us uh, what we call PNT or position navigation and time, and time is a critical aspect uh, in the beginning of of all things GPS uh, is a very accurate time. So uh, within critical infrastructure, uh, and that's been defined by certain market segments like uh, communications. Um, and communications uses the time from GPS to coordinate uh, all of the, uh, the signals in the cellular telephone network. Um, you know, most importantly today, you hear all the buzzwords around 5G. Well, 5G is uh, uh, exclusively dependent on the use of uh, GPS uh, to coordinate all of those, uh, you know, signals coming from the towers, and there's more towers than there were in 4G. Uh, which was also dependent on um, GPS. Um, also, um, you know, data centers are, are extremely dependent on that. The data centers are the places in the, you know, we call the cloud collectively that hold all of our information and, and have uh, large databases that need to be synchronized um, from place to place so that you know, content is delivered and your information is stored securely. Uh, that also takes an incredible amount of time coordination amongst uh, uh, places all around the world. Um, and, uh, and 
even important, more importantly, is uh, in the power networks. In power, uh, uh, you know, we don't really think of time, but you know, all of the signals. You know, in North America, we use uh, 60 cycles per second. Uh, those 60 60 hertz uh, need to be coordinated, um, and and the move is to uh, coordinate uh, so that we can allow. Um, some of the renewable things like uh, wind and solar to come on and off the grid and be used most efficiently. So, so time is very important um, in our daily lives. I didn't get into the you know financial transactions and all that, but you know there's different aspects um, that you know are completely dependent on time, and and for the most part, that time comes from uh, what we know as GPS. Um, so, so you know so given it, it, that. So, so given that that situation, so that's a lot of systems that are both interrelated, critical to day to day life, uh, important to all of us. I mean, our banking information, you know, all of that stuff is all tied into that system. Um, it, it seems to me uh, that this is a growing security issue as well, right? I mean, if if all of this stuff is tied together and all of it's tied to one system, uh, that presents security problems, does it, does it not? It, it does, and uh, the Department of Homeland Security has uh, actually classified it as a cybersecurity issue. Um, you know, what I, I mentioned, the GPS uses extremely low power signals uh, in such that uh, it makes them uh, subject to interference or jamming. Um, there's uh, another, you know, jamming being it just knocks the signal off the air. Uh, there's another technique called spoofing that's becoming more and more prevalent, and that is uh, providing false information to a GPS uh, receiver. Um, and you can uh, do a web search, and there's a news article just about every day on some sort of uh, spoofing. And that, you know, these things can be intentional or un unintentional, but the re results are the same. It's a, it's an impact on critical infrastructure. Not not so dissimilar, you know, not exactly the same, but, you know, we saw with the, you know, the colonial pipeline thing a couple of weeks ago, um, what kind of chaos it causes when critical infrastructure is impacted. So, you know, um, another, uh, you know, cyber threat is you know, impacting GPS and, uh, and ultimately has, you know, the potential to have bad ramifications. So, so given that, um, you know, it would be my assumption that uh, both industry uh, standardization bodies and uh, certainly governmental uh, bodies, governments, uh, government agencies uh, are, are probably looking at this. Are they? <laughs> is there is there yeah. something going on that uh, you know it could, you can share with us about you know what what the next steps are, or what's being done to address yeah, this because it, it's it's a huge issue. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a, a lot of activities in in those areas. Uh, you know, first and foremost is in, um, you know, administrative and law. Um, in uh, 2018, uh, there was a, an act of the U.S. Congress uh, called the National Timing, Resiliency, and Security Act. Um, that went into place, empowered the Department of Transportation to take action uh, in providing a uh, alternative to GPS or a backup, if you will, uh, that was terrestrial based and not relying on satellites. Uh, and further, uh, in 2020, uh, there was a presidential uh, executive order, number 13905, focusing on strengthening uh, the use of PNT within federal federal agencies. Um, coincident with that, the Department of Homeland Security has been working on a framework on GPS receivers to make them more hardened and secure. You know, um, the U.S. military you know, identified some problems many years ago and came up with their own solution, but the civilian side, you know, needed to do something. So DHS has taken the lead on that. Uh, they've pr published uh, on their website, you can find it, uh, a, a framework uh, outlining uh, receiver uh, uh, hard, hardiness. And then, um, uh, you know, also within DHS, uh, they have the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, uh, and they publish advisories on uh, issues around G uh, GPS and others. Um, and you can see the website there under uh, PNT. Um, so there's a lot of activities going on. You know, the DHS work on the framework is now moving over to an international body called the IEEE uh, that's going to take it to the next step on defining uh, more things because the, the, the threats to GPS uh, evolve over time. And, 
And so a more dynamic uh, approach needs to be taken. So, uh, so forgive me for being somewhat cynical, um, but it's my, uh, my general impression that when things like this move into large governmental bodies and certainly international governmental bodies, uh, something eventually gets done, but uh, but the emphasis there is on the word eventually. There's <laughs> there's a time lag here, uh, and and these are not the fastest uh, solutions. So, uh, what can what can we offer? What can be done in the meantime to provide uh, some level of security, some level of backup uh, uh, to this important system? And and what can companies do to uh, to implement some kind of uh, backup or fail yeah, so uh, you know as the experts in frequency and time and um, you know basically all things timing uh, you know we we've uh, provided our input and in, and uh, in, uh, in, in contributions to all of these uh, different bodies and um, in in, a, in concert with that we also uh, you know look at all of the different levels of performance and and things that uh, each of these industries within critical infrastructure require. Uh, and what we've done is we've come up with a, uh, a, a total solution um, that, you know, kind of ticks the box on the, the resiliency of GPS, but it, it takes it the next step and it, it provides, you know, what we consider to be the, the top three things into providing a, a, a trusted time. And uh, that is, you know, a trusted time source that's uh, connected to UTC or the, the world standard, which GPS is as well, but there are other means to get that, uh, provide a, a reliable uh, time delivery mechanism um, across a distributed uh, network and as well as uh, protection under all conditions. So, you know, uh, in, in the event that, you know, something breaks, it still needs to uh, stand up on its own and because some of these uh, within critical infrastructure you know, not only have an economic uh, impact, but they're all uh, also uh, safety of life issues. So, you know, it needs to be available, um, you know, at a very high percentage of the time. And so uh, what we've done is uh, package this together, made the solution very easy. Uh, and, we, and we call it the uh, virtual primary reference time clock, uh, a distributed architecture that ticks all those boxes. Um, you know, has its heart in uh, atomic clocks, which, you know, are also at the heart of uh, GPS and other systems, uh, uh, as well as mechanisms for moving the time around and, and providing survivability uh, under all conditions. So, so, so this is, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, so, so this is something that a, a, uh, uh, a call center or somebody could implement and, and provide a backup in case... GPS fails, or would it be something that's running concurrent with GPS, or how would that how would that work? Yeah, so they, they could both live in the same world. You know, the GPS is uh, you know is still you know kind of there and the gold standard and deployed, and you know these things take a little time to implement. But um, you know this doesn't require GPS, uh, but it certainly can use GPS uh, where it's available. Great. Okay, well, thanks for that quick tour. Uh, Austin, questions, uh, questions from the audience? Can you uh, uh, bring us up to date on what we've heard? Absolutely. Yes, we do have our first question via email we have uh, for Duke. It's going to be, are there any international initiatives in place to set guidelines on how to protect critical infrastructures against GNSS cybersecurity threats? Sure. Um, so I mentioned that the um, Department of Homeland Security here in the U.S. has, um, you know, done some uh, work over the last couple of years on res uh, receiver resiliency and survivability. And that work's going to move to the IEEE. And so IEEE global body um, is, uh, you know, going to undertake that and, and further uh, improve the robustness uh, requirements. So there are also other Things within the ITU and other standards organizations that have, uh, you know, looked at this, um, you know, but uh, it, it looks like IEEE is going to be taking the lead. Awesome. Thank you so much, Duke. We'll certainly keep an eye out for their guidance. As far as the second question we have here for you, are there examples of cases where this type of resilient timing architecture has been deployed? Yeah. So, um, 
So one of the interesting things, you know, GPS has been around for a long time. Um, it, it was used in, in the, I'll use the communications networks, for example. Uh, you know, it was uh, widely deployed starting with 3G, exclusively deployed in 4G, and uh, in 5G, it's uh, uh, critically dependent on GPS, but they've kind of grown up together. And so um, what what has happened is that with the uh, technology uh, with 5G and the resiliency that's coming about in uh, with the VPRTC, we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, uh, communications operators implement this kind of survivability because they understand the the dependency on uh, GPS is is a, is a considerable risk. Thank you very much, Duke. Yeah, I can I can certainly see how communications uh, indirectly may be tied to safety of life, um, just being able to communicate. So, hey, a, th a third question here for you. The executive order on resilient PNT and the other calls to action seem to be very high level. Do you have a specific set of recommendations that can be implemented today to follow these security requirements? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I agree. They, they're, they're quite high level. Uh, left, uh, you know, to each uh, operator of uh, critical infrastructure to, to do their own thing. Uh, and so that's really what kind of pushed us to develop this concept of the uh, virtual primary reference time clock. Uh, we build time scales for nations, uh, for companies, for um, uh, independent uh government uh, governmental agencies so we have very broad experience in this and so we were able to take that knowledge uh, and, and push it such that it's a simple deployable um, solution set for any of the critical infrastructure operators perfect duke well thank you so much for taking the time to answer our audience questions i think that may be all that we have uh, for today but once again folks go ahead and check out those links in the description as well as send us any further questions you may have live stream at microchip.com that's all for me today back to you ross thanks austin appreciate it and uh, again you can find uh, a wealth of information on this on our website microchip.com so go rummage around take a look uh, this is a little bit of housekeeping. This is episode two of season four, uh, my second episode. Um, if you are interested in watching this episode again uh, or interested in finding any of the other 20 or so episodes from previous seasons, uh, we have updated the webpage on microchip.com. It's a little bit easier to find stuff now. You can see not only uh, links to all of the old material, uh, but also uh, a schedule of upcoming content. So uh, a much more robust environment now. So do, uh, you know, a cup of coffee, go take a look, a pot of coffee, pot of coffee and go binge watch. Uh, it's all out there. So uh, uh, do take a look and uh, I hope you, uh, hope you enjoy that. A uh, couple just thank yous. So thanks to Duke. Thanks for being with us today. Austin. Yeah, hey, so I uh, just... Uh, microchip.com slash VPRTC. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, Austin, thanks as always for helping the booth. Uh, Dave, Kurt, thanks for all the help on the production. Flawless as always. We will be back uh, in two weeks on our normal time frame. Wednesday, I believe that is the 4th of August at 9 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, the topic then will be, I think, microchip and the maker community. What we're doing to support maker. Uh, and some of the, some of the recent uh, additions to the portfolio of tools and products. So don't miss that. Uh, look forward to seeing you then. Uh, until then, stay happy, stay healthy, stay curious, and keep on learning, and look forward to seeing you again. Thanks so much.